Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, uh, we will continue with our lectures on optimal guidance, uh, I mean control guidance and estimation course, uh, we are in lecture number 2. So, very first class we saw some uh, some overview and then some motivations of this course and uh, this particular lecture will uh, will have some overview of state space approach and a little bit overview of matrix theory. So, these are the two things that we uh, use it very extensively here in this course. So, I thought we will just have a overview of that and I assume that you must have already taken some course on, on this subject. So, and this just to kind of refresh your knowledge on that. So, let us start with uh, state space representation, very very basic ideas and all that. So, when you talk about any system, I mean dynamical systems, uh, we typically talk about uh, three types of variables. One is uh, input variable and the other one is output variable, the third one is state variable. And I kind of discussed that in the first lecture also and uh, typically the input variable can be classified into two classes. One is uh, manipulative which is control variable or either it or it can be non manipulative which is noise and remember both are input to the system anyway. And then considering output variable uh, that can be uh, defined as either the variables of interest uh, or that can be like some measured variable or calculated variable. So, these two may or may not be same and this is what the diagram it tells. Uh, see, now, in other words, your performance output can be y and that you want to drive it to some desired value y star, uh, but the whereas the measurement output can be z and that may that may go into the controller and then control design can take place actually. So, it may be so happening that part of the y variables or part uh, or full of the I mean all of the y variables can be part of z and vice versa probably, but they need not be same actually. Okay, so, all these things uh, can be uh, talked about in a standard state space class and all that. But anyways, uh, coming back uh, there is also some class uh, I mean this uh, variables of uh, great importance is state variable and that is defined as minimum set of parameters uh, which completely summarize the system status. And more definitions, more implications and things like that can be found in a standard textbook um, uh, on systems theory and uh, any modern control book will kind of give you more insights with examples and all that actually. But we understand what it is, uh, it, uh, what it, uh, what we mean by state variable and that means there is a minimum number of uh, variables so which can describe the system state. And obviously, remember that you cannot take uh, more than the state variable that is required or you cannot take uh, less than the state variable that is required either actually. Okay. So, that is uh, uh, those things are kind of known to us actually. Now, continuing further, uh, we have uh, broadly uh, two classes of uh, systems that we, we discuss about here and one is uh, nonlinear systems, the other one is linear systems actually. And when you talk about nonlinear systems, we represent the state equations this way, x dot equal to f of x u. Typically, time variable t is not there, where x dot represents derivative with respect to time. And remember uh, state variable dimension of state is uh, R n that means n number of states are there. Control can be R m, control belongs to R m that means uh, u can be of m dimensional and uh, the output that we are that of interest uh, can be of p dimensional actually. And also uh, this R letter R represents real numbers. So, so we, we are typically deal with all real numbers here. And uh, but uh, I mean nonlinear systems, uh, as we know, are typically it's a little bit difficult to handle and difficult to analyze, synthesize all that. So most of the time, you, we linearize the system about some operating point and all that, and then end up with uh, uh, some uh, representations like that, where x dot equal to x plus b, y equal to c x plus d u. But remember, this x what you see in nonlinear system, and this x what you see in linear system, the meaning wise they are different. When you when you talk about uh, state of state of nonlinear system. It is actually the true state, whereas the state of linearized system, uh, most of the linear systems are anyway linearized. So, the linearized uh, state and control are typically deviation variables actually. So, that means x represents delta x and u represents delta u implicitly here. Basically. And delta x can be the deviation uh, of the state from its operating point and delta u can be the deviation of control from its operating control and all that actually. Okay. So, those kind of definitions are available. 
So, in this particular course, we will deal both with linear system as well as nonlinear system. I mean, we cannot, uh, we are not talking about only one class of things, we will deal with uh, both of the things together actually. And coming to the state variable selection, uh, uh, typically the number of state variable that is the order of the system is equal to the number of independent energy storage elements, okay. but there are exceptions as well, we uh, can see couple of examples in probably in uh, some standard textbooks like Norman Nice and all that will, will give you that actually. Yeah. But is there any restriction on the selection of the state variable? I mean the answer is yes uh, and the very primary requirement is all the state variables should be linear independent and then uh, all of them must collectively describe the system completely. I mean that is the, these are the two things that the state variable should have actually. Now, coming to the linearization of nonlinear systems, uh, as you remember that, uh, that that is what I told you here. The linear systems are typically linearization of nonlinear systems uh, about some operating point actually. So, how do, how is it done? Typically, I mean, how is it done? Let us see that. The problem statement here is uh, given a nonlinear system like this x dot equal f of x u, can you derive an approximate linear system uh, about an operating point x 0 u 0? The approximate linear system can be described as something like this actually. And also remember when you talk about operating point, uh, typically the misnomer is uh, it is an equilibrium point, but uh, need not be true actually. So, operating point by definition is a point through which the system trajectory pass passes. That means, even if it is passing through a transient uh, trajectory and all that actually, that can be a potential operating point. And so, that is how sometimes we linearize the system about a trajectory continuously we keep on getting a new new uh, new linear, I mean linearized systems, uh, that means the A and B matrix will become time varying and all that actually, if you do that. But if it is a equilibrium point, uh, that is your operating point and uh, then you linearize the system, then you will end up with A and B being constant matrices and these constant matrices, uh, that is why you will get into this also called uh, linear time invariant uh, systems and all that actually. That way. Okay. But remember that the operating point is a point through which the system trajectory passes, that is the definition actually. Okay. And obviously, if a equilibrium point is uh, also a point through which system trajectory passes, because uh, if it is a stable system, ultimately the trajectory will come and sit there. So, that is also a possibility of an operating point actually. So, anyway, so these, these are the ideas there. Uh, the key point to note is uh, even though we represent the same state uh, notation, state and control notation x and u, when you talk about linear systems, uh, by definition, this state is actually deviation state and this state is actually deviation control actually. All right. So, proceeding further, how do we get it? Uh, that is, that is through this Taylor series expansion and all that. So, you have a system, nonlinear system, where we have a reference point here, something like x naught u naught. So, if you if you put the x equal to x naught plus delta x and u equal to u naught plus delta u, and then that then this side of the story f of x uh, x u can be represented represented like this, and then you use the Taylor series expansion when you can uh, expand it uh, something like a first term, a constant term followed by two linear terms in, in state and control, then these higher order terms. So, if you and also remember the operating point is a point through which the system trajectory passes, that means this x naught u naught satisfies the differential equation. That means, if I substitute x 0 dot x naught dot, then that is nothing but f of x naught u naught. So, this is what is exploited here. Remember this side of the story is like this. So, but that side of the story will be something like that, like x dot equal to x 0 dot plus delta x dot. So, that is nothing but equal to this right hand side, okay, neglecting the higher dot terms, it is approximately equal. And then uh, we take, okay, th this two will cancel out because uh, this is what the operating point uh, is all about. Uh, th this is, this two will go, okay. And then you will end up with uh, this uh, x naught equal to. Uh, then you will end up with this uh, this x naught equal to uh, I mean delta x dot equal to a times delta x plus b times delta x, delta u. But uh, instead of uh, writing down all the time delta x and delta u think like that, we implicitly redefine it as uh, delta x equal to x and delta u is, is u. Then this leads to x dot equal to x plus u. That is how this a x this x and u represent this delta x and delta u I mean, that way. But also, I mean, uh, if x naught u naught happens to be 0, 0, then obviously this delta x equal to x and then uh, delta u is also equal to u basically. So, these are the uh, corollaries and all that. And remember, a and b will be defined in terms of this Jacobian matrices that way. 
So, you have this uh, this state equation with the system model is, if is available to you. So, expand this partial derivatives that way and then put it them in a matrix form and evaluate at the point of x naught u naught actually. That is what you will do for uh, A and B matrix. A happens to be n by n square matrix and B will happen to be n by m non square matrix in general basically. Now, coming to so now if you land up with some 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 system equation like that and try to carry out a lot of algebra and then optimal control synthesis and things like that. Obviously, we have to deal with these matrices A and B. So, we have a lot of uh, requirement for matrix and algebra on the way actually. And also we will deal with even if you deal with nonlinear system we have to deal with gradient matrices and all the gradient vectors and things like that. So, we certainly need the concepts from matrix theory actually. Let us uh, have a quick overview of uh, matrix theory in general and then we can uh, from next class onwards we will go to optimization theory or little bit overview of uh, numerical methods as well before you go to optimization theory and all that actually. Okay. Anyway, so coming uh, coming to the review of uh, matrix theory, so let us start with very simple definitions. We all understand what uh, what is uh, meant by matrices, so I am not going to that level. It is a collection of numbers in an array and things like that, but uh, coming to some definitions, standard definition, uh, a symmetric matrix is represented as something like this. When A is equal to A transpose, then obviously A satisfies uh, the property of symmetricity. Now, when determinant of A becomes a, a becomes 0 and uh, here we assume that uh, A is a square matrix, then we talk about uh, well the matrix is, uh, is a singular matrix actually, that means inverse does not exist actually. Then what is inverse? Uh, inverse of a matrix A and B, uh, I mean if, if B is an inverse of A, then uh, this satisfies this property A B equal to B A is, is nothing but identity basically. So, that is how this, this, uh, this forms the definition. And uh, and then uh, as a standard result, uh, A inverse turns out to be adjoint of A divided by determinant A. And again, I emphasize here uh, that uh, don't get confused with uh, what is definition and what is a standard result actually. As far as definition is concerned, I will put uh, this is a definition. Okay, A B equal to B A equal to identity. And lot of these theorems proof and uh, and then general results and all will be very easy to deal uh, do using this definition uh, A B equal to B A equal to identity. However, if you really want to compute an A inverse for a for a matrix and all, but probably that is that is a standard results that we typically use also many times. Even though it is not very computationally efficient way of computing uh, A inverse by the way. Okay. Uh, so, that is the two difference. It happens to be like one and the same. Uh, in other words, both are if and only if and only if condition sort of thing. So, so, sometimes people get confused that A inverse definition is this, this adjoint of A divided by determinant of A, but, uh, but in definition sense this is the definition and this happens to be a standard result actually. Now, the next concept is uh, what is called as orthogonal matrix and orthogonal matrix happens to be something like uh, okay. orthogonal matrix happens to be something like uh, this way. So, if A, A transpose equal to A transpose A equal to identity, then it is an orthogonal matrix actually. Okay. And uh, okay, it also remember that A and A, A times A transpose and A transpose A uh, are guaranteed to be kind of uh, I mean square matrix even though A is a non square. And on top of that you can also show that A transpose A and A, A transpose both happens to be something like uh, positive semi definite matrix and things like that, uh, it is not that difficult to show actually. But anyway, in addition to that, if they satisfy this property that A transpose equal to A transpose A equal to identity, then uh, the matrix A is called as an orthogonal matrix. And one property of orthogonal matrix is, uh, is like this, uh, if a matrix A is orthogonal, then all its columns are supposed to be orthonormal vectors actually to each other. So, I mean uh, that uh, that is a vector sense basically, that means uh, if you have a A matrix, uh, oh sorry, uh, if you have a A matrix. Uh, uh, of some matrix which is given by some columns and all that that way. And then each of the columns that you see here uh, will be orthogonal to rather orthonormal to each other actually in a vector sense. Basically. So, the uh, typical example is something like this, it is a very standard uh, what is called as a rotational matrix. That means, if you have a point uh, uh, okay, then the representation uh, turns out to be like this. Uh, okay. Right. If you have uh, something like uh, uh, some, I mean this uh, coordinate frame and things like that, you have this uh, 
x versus y coordinate frame and you have a point where x y is there and then the question here is if the coordinate frame rotates by an angle theta let us say that means you have y prime and x, x prime y prime this is again angle theta then in the in the new coordinate frame x prime y prime what is the what is the i mean the values of this coordinate x prime y prime so then that is that is kind of given by this this transformation matrix and all that is this that is why it is called a rotation matrix if you take a coordinate in the original coordinate frame and, and multiply with this pre multiply with this matrix then whatever number you get that number happens to be your uh, your coordinate in the new coordinate frame actually all right and this result i have already told you that the columns of an orthogonal matrix are nothing but they are orthonormal to each other in a vector sense actually the next concept is uh, eigen values and eigen vectors and uh, this is how it uh, how we can uh, think of uh, interpreting it actually now this is a common mistake that people take okay if it is a eigen vector then uh, well uh, i mean there is a standard equation for that and then i will solve it and uh, especially about eigen values so is it a minus lambda I is determinant equal to 0 and then i'll get values for lambda and that is nothing but uh, eigen values and all so those that is a standard result again but the concept can be understood something like this uh, let's start with a simple understanding here so let's take a take a point p in a coordinate frame x and y so uh, and talk about this uh, let's say this is something like x1 x2 okay so the coordinate frame coordinate frame happens to be something like uh, well uh, okay whatever this is this is the uh, i mean horizontal and that as the vertical coordinate frame you can think of in general yeah. okay so you have a point p okay and that is x1 x2 okay originally and uh, and we multiply that uh, that by a matrix okay some matrix a then we we'll end up with some numbers y1 and y2 and that y1 y2 can re can represent a, a point uh, in the coordinate frame uh, something like q that means if i join this origin to this this point p and the origin to this point q then i am actually getting two vectors okay now the if you look at it slightly closely then it turns out that by simply by multiplying this vector x1 x2 by a matrix a uh, what i have done i have i have transformed this point p to q in general in in a way i am what i am doing is uh, i am uh, actually taking this vector and then rotating it as well as stretching it so there is a stretching and rotation in operation involved basically so any matrix multiplication is uh, matrix are also called linear operators by the way so any matrix multiplication with a set with a vector will give you another vector and that vector need not contain the same magnitude and same direction actually so it can be it can act as something like a stretching operator as well as a rotating rotation operator now the question here is something like this okay it may not happen in general but uh, suppose suppose i have a vector x some direction somewhere okay and i multiply that with uh, with matrix a i get another y which is aligned along the x, x i mean this vector origin to x vector and is aligned there that means this matrix is operating uh, only as a stretching vector not as a operating op not as a rotation operator but as a simply as a stretching operator so that in that means it doesn't affect any other direction it just uh, takes the vector uh, x and then just uh, stretches it, it uh, stretches it along further actually and stretching by definition can mean shrinking also uh, so that is also a possibility actually so that is that is the question you are asking actually so the in other words does there exist any any vector x some vector x for a particular matrix a so that the this operation a times x will give us a vector y which is nothing but a stretched value of vector x basically that's all you are talking uh, so in other words uh, if you if you think about that uh, that is that is how the, this uh, this all starts actually so you are asking something some equation like uh, what are you asking if i y is nothing but uh, i can interpret that uh, y equal to nothing but lambda x sort of thing okay but y is also ax remember that so what i am getting here is ax equal to lambda x that is how the eigen of, i mean eigen vector eigen uh, value and eigen vector equation is defined actually okay so y is nothing but lambda x that means that is a stretching operator and y by definition is a times x anyway so that's how you get uh, a into lambda x actually so that is how you get it but then the solution when the question is when does when can we have a solution to this equation 
and that solution to this equation obviously turns out that okay, if that is the true and that has to be true as well lambda i minus a equal to I mean lambda i minus a well whole multiply with x equal to 0 and if you really need to have a non trivial solution that means uh, remember this equation is invariably true if you have 0 0 0 0 as x vector that means it is a very trivial thing we are not moving anything away from the origin actually. So, other than that if you take any other thing then to the, for this to have a meaningful solution a non trivial solution we should have this relationship satisfied that is the standard result from uh, linear system of equations actually yeah. that is how this equation comes here actually. Yeah. So, this is uh, if you if you take this equation remember determinant is a scalar operator. So, uh, you get one equation, but then uh, this can be a nth order difference nth order algebraic equation that means you can have n solutions and other actually. Okay. So, that is how you get uh, if the matrix is of uh, a dimension n by n then you will end up with something like uh, n equations I mean uh, nth order equation and hence you will have n eigen values. And because these coefficients will be real numbers, you will uh, end up with either real numbers as solutions or complex conjugated solution. You cannot have a single complex number hanging out actually. So, that is the that is the standard result again actually. Okay, where do we use these concepts? Uh, okay, by the way, how do you evaluate eigen vectors and all? Uh, once you evaluate the eigen values like this, you go back and put it uh, put it there. But remember, it does not uh, give you some sort of a, like a unique solution, it may give you uh, a something like an under constraint equation and hence you will have infinite solution, but also remember Eigen vector by definition they do not have any magnitude that means you are happy with only only the direction of that ok. So, that uh, and then some uh, sometimes we do this normalization of the vector and tell ok normalize Eigen vector and all that, but by definition Eigen vectors do not contain or do not have any uh, magnitude associated with them actually. Anyway, so this is how it is. Uh, what is the utility? Utility of this analysis uh, is huge. It, it is uh, used in stability and control analysis. It is used in optimal control synthesis of linear systems anyway. It is also used in model reduction principal component analysis and the, and the variety of uh, other applications in, in almost every field of uh, engineering actually. So, that is how uh, the importance of this, this concept comes actually that way. Now, there are certain very standard uh, results that come handy also. And one of the few results, I mean, very standard results. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, take it through. So, in other words, uh, this standard result tells you that if you have uh, lambda one to lambda n as eigenvalues of uh, matrix A, which is of n by n, then for any positive integer m, you really don't have to evaluate this uh, to the power m and then go through this uh, this equation and all that actually. The result tells you that uh, if I have a to the power m, then that eigen values of a to the power m will satisfy this relationship. Means all that I have to do is just to take it, uh, just to kind of find the individual powers of these values, and I am done actually. It's very easy to show that uh, from a proof sense also. In a second order sense, I will show that. So you start with something like lambda x equal to lambda x. That is how it will, uh, lambda will satisfy uh, eigen value property of matrix A. Now, just that you do multiply both sides ok that you will get a into lambda x ok a into ok sorry ok as you will get a into lambda x and then if you if you go through that and then this turns out to be something like a square x equal to uh, lambda times a x and lambda times a x is again uh, you know this uh, lambda times uh, uh, sorry a x equal lambda x. So, that then you will end up with lambda square x. So, a square x is nothing but lambda square x sort of thing actually. So, that means it tells you that lambda square is an eigen value of uh, a square. So, that is uh, uh, very strong and then you can keep on repeating this exercise to to get higher power higher powers as well actually ok. okay. So, let us continue then the next one it is very easy to show that again that if I what about a inverse actually. So, remember a inverse is a computational expensive operation. So, we do not really do not want to carry out inverse operation unless otherwise it is badly necessary. And also turns out that uh, if I know the eigen values of a matrix already then the inverse uh, matrix a inverse that will have eigen values as something like nothing but uh, lambda inverse that means 1 by lambda sort of thing. Actually. So, they are uh, eigen values of a inverse again very easy to show that by simply taking a inverse multiplying both sides by a inverse actually you will end up with x here in the left hand side and then it will be a inverse in the right hand side 
and then you will very easily so you can take 1 by lambda into x equal to a inverse x sort of thing till here. So, you can do the algebra yourself and you will get convinced in uh, just x 2 line algebra actually to show that. Okay. And the third third thing third uh, property that uh, comes to mind is uh, for a triangular matrix remember it can be either upper triangular or lower triangular and of course, uh, diagonal matrices are uh, special cases of that uh, as well. And for such matrices the Eigen values are nothing but diagonal elements actually. It is extremely easy to show that against or starting from this equation. If it is uh, if this equation will not get perturbed anywhere else you will just simply deal with these diagonal, ele diagonal elements and hence you will get something like I mean very easily you can show that it will be multiplication of lambda minus uh, well the diagonal element a 1 1 uh, lambda minus a 1 1 into lambda minus a 2 2 into lambda minus a 3 3 like that all that thing equal to 0 and hence lambda will be nothing but a 1 1 a 2 2 a 3 3 like that actually all these happens to be diagonal elements actually. So, this is how it, uh, it again uh, it can be shown this way. Now, coming to this uh, uh, some of these uh, other properties and this happens to be quite useful property actually uh, that uh, if uh, some uh, I mean symmetric it is not, not symmetric if, uh, if a square matrix is symmetric ok. The theorem talks like this uh, that uh, if a square matrix is symmetric then its Eigen values are all real. Uh, and remember Eigen values can in general be either real or complex conjugate pairs actually. But this theorem tells you that all that is necessary for this theorem is that matrix needs to be symmetric. And if you have a symmetric matrix its Eigen values are guaranteed to be real actually and it can be proved also. It a little bit uh, involved proof, but it can be shown with uh, not that much of a difficulty either actually. And uh, the theorem again tells you that uh, not only that moreover it has n linear independent Eigen vectors. So, these are a beautiful property of a symmetric matrix. So, whenever we do not have a symmetric matrix we will rather try to decompose that in something like uh, uh, I mean a, a combination of symmetric and then skew symmetric matrix and all that actually. But that is a I mean those things are standard results in linear algebra anyway. Uh, but it talks I mean this just notice that it, uh, I mean if you really know that a matrix is symmetric then you can very quickly conclude that Eigen values are real and it has n linear independent Eigen vectors as well actually very very beautiful and very powerful property actually. So, I certainly say, uh, urge you not to forget this actually that way. And this next one next theorem tells you that if a square matrix and n real Eigen values and n real orthogonal Eigen vectors then the matrix is symmetric as well. So, this is kind of a a counter uh, theorem for this for this particular thing actually ok. This theorem tells that if a if a matrix is symmetric then this uh, this thing happen. The question is when the other thing reverse thing happens actually and the answer to that is here that if a matrix has n real Eigen values n as well as n real orthogonal uh, Eigen vectors then only the matrix is symmetric. So, that is uh, property something like a converse theorem basically. Then uh, the next one talks about uh, something like this A transpose A and A transpose A are always positive semi definite matrices actually ok. It is uh, again it is very easy to show it is not that difficult at all. So, if you have uh, A A transpose for example uh, ok what is positive semi definite and all I think uh, if you yeah if it, it is here actually let us go there and then we will go back to that. So, the by definition a matrix is said to be positive definite uh, provided uh, uh, you I mean it satisfies this relationship that if I carry out this operation x transpose a x for any non trivial x that means x all that is necessary is x is not on the origin actually x, x is not equal to 0 0 0. I take any real number I mean any value for x uh, vector and simply carry out this algebra this x transpose a x ok. So, this x transpose a x remember it is a 1 by n times n by n times uh, n by 1 that means it is actually guaranteed to be a scalar quantity. So, this scalar quantity if it is greater than 0 for all such x ok then the matrix is called as positive definite. And if you can uh, tell only this much that it can be either positive or equal to 0 ok greater than equal to 0 then it turns out to be positive semi definite. And uh, similarly if it is strictly negative then it turns out negative and uh, less than equal to 0 it turns out to be negative definite. And again remember this side of the thing is definition and that these definitions are tightly related to these properties. But many times again we take these properties as the definition when we forget that this is to this is where it comes from actually. 
So, whenever there is a there is something to sew and things like that, I certainly urge that uh, you carry out operations along with uh, this definition idea essentially that will be much easier. But when you want to evaluate uh, and if you know some values, some properties of Eisen, I mean some values of Eisen values and things like the numerical values, then looking at those values you can also conclude whether the matrix is positive definite or not in all that actually. But anyway, coming back to this, uh, the claim here what I told is A transpose A or A A transpose both are always guaranteed to be positive semi definite at least. Now, it is very easy to see that A A transpose is guaranteed to be a square matrix no matter whatever whether A is a square matrix or not. Now, all that you all that both actually I mean both A transpose A and A A transpose are guaranteed to be positive semi definite. Now, all that you need to show that suppose I want to show this as a positive semi definite then by definition I have to do this this operation where for all non trivial x and that turns out to be let us this is similar anyway. So, let us not worry about that let us carry out this one uh, this turns out to be x transpose A transpose into A x ok and this is nothing but if you take it a uh, this transpose property and all this is nothing but A x transpose times A x and if you define y remember A x is nothing but as a vector actually A x is a vector. So, I can define that as y. So, essentially this I will end up with something like y transpose y and that is uh, if you think a little bit carefully this is component sense it is going to be something like y 1 square plus y 2 square plus y n square or something ok. So, this uh, is guaranteed to be positive greater than and equal to 0 ok all these are summation of quadratic terms and things like that. So, it is very easy to show that uh, this A transpose A is uh, guaranteed to be positive semi definite at least actually ok. And uh, there is another result which tells you that uh, if A is a positive semi definite matrix then uh, every principal sub matrix of A is also a symmetric and positive definite ok. In particular the diagonal elements of A are guaranteed to be positive actually ok. So, because we talk uh, this is a concept of uh, sub matrix and things like that, uh, but remember if, if somebody tells us that uh, there is a positive definite matrix A then the diagonal elements of A are certainly going to be positive. So, that is a property that many times we use actually. So, this is I have already told when uh, what is defined as positive definite uh, positive semi definite negative definite negative semi definite matrices actually. Then there is another concept called vector norms again we use it heavily in, uh, in optimal control theory as well and vector norm is defined something like that it is a, it's a real valued function that means the output is always a real number uh, which satisfies the following properties again. That means uh, if I know a vector x the norm of vector x can never be I mean uh, never be negative and it is uh, most of the time it is positive it is only it is 0 only if x is a trivial vector 0 that means if only if x is 0 0 0, zero, zero that origin vector origin point rather then only the norm is 0 otherwise it is, is always guaranteed to be positive. Essentially the norm is nothing but uh, the concept of distance actually distance from the origin is something like that, that way. So, distance from the origin is 0 only when you are at the origin itself okay. anywhere else the distance is certainly going to be positive that kind of thing. Actually. It also satisfies the second property ok alpha times x if alpha is a scalar if you take the norm it will satisfy modulus of alpha and times norm of x that means it does not matter the sign of alpha really actually. So, whether alpha is positive or negative it is guaranteed to stretch it actually that way. Then there is also a triangle inequality result which tells you that if I take vector x and vector y and I sum it up and then take the norm that is going to satisfy this this less than equal to norm x plus norm y actually. So, that is the concept of uh, vector norms uh, uh, meaning of having a distance actually. And some standard results uh, there are various norms which can uh, which can be defined for computation purpose and the first thing that comes to your mind is uh, one norm. So, that means you just simply take the components and then take the kind of absolute values and sum it up there is nothing but one norm. Two norm is something very standard we all know that ok. So, we just take squares of everything and then take half and obviously here you can always argue that modulus is not necessary true, but uh, to have a systematic uh, way of definition we take modulus everywhere just for math sake actually. Then if you have norm 3 you can do the similar algebra take third powers everywhere and then take one third and similarly the pth norm in a standard notation sense it can be defined that way. An infinity norm turns out to be like this going by this definition and it can be shown it is an interesting uh, kind of result actually. 
that even though infinity to power and 1 by infinity and things like that are there, it is essentially it has a meaning and it turns out to be that the maximum value of this modulus of xi. That means, if you simply simply take this modulus thing and do not add it up, just look at the values and see which is the maximum value okay, and that value is nothing but infinity norm actually. And very interestingly, it turns out that in finite dimensional vector space, so that means, uh, the dimension is really not infinity. Uh, in other words, x has some n components only, it does not contain keep on containing uh, many terms, I mean infinity components really. Then, uh, the th in finite dimensional vector space, uh, all norms are something like uh, equivalent. That means, uh, if, uh, if you prove something using some norm, whatever norm is that, and some sort of a similar property will hold even if you talk about uh, any other norm actually. Okay. So, this is the standard um, property in finite dimensional vector space actually which is not true in infinite dimensional space actually that way. Okay. Now, going uh, go, I mean moving on further uh, there is a concept called uh, matrix norm as well and the matrix norm turns out to be something like that. The again remember uh, a times x is nothing but a vector. So, so, a times x is an operator basically it takes transforms the vector x to vector y basically that way we have seen that uh, little before. Now, the question is if you ok let us go back to that diagram and here if you have a x and this is like a stretching operator even in general its vector gets transformed p to q and there is a stretching operation involved there actually ok. So, the so in that context uh, the question here is if I multiply uh, any vector x with uh, with matrix A, then I am getting a vector y which is a different uh, I mean different magnitude and things like that. Now, the question is uh, how much does it get stressed because of because of A, not because the originally the vector it itself was longer or shorter, we are not interested in that. So, so originally it can be longer or shorter. Okay, then uh, it we, we are not interested in that kind of thing, uh, we are telling that uh, uh, I mean, if I multiply a vector, uh, vector by matrix A, then I get some uh, some vector. And the question is, uh, how much I am stretching the vector? Okay, <coughs> how much I am stretching the vector because I multiply it with uh, uh, matrix A? That's that's the question actually. And that can be operated. Uh, that can be argued that okay, I can um, evaluate it this way. That means I evaluate the norm of Y and divide it over again by norm of X actually. Okay. So, this is something by something like that. So, that is how it is evaluated. Remember this vector norm the both these are numerator and denominator are vectors and vector norms are already defined here. So, you to pick up any norm that norm first norm, second norm, third norm and all that and then you can talk about uh, carrying out this uh, this algebra and it turns out to be uh, the it is actually defined some sort of amplifying um, factor or amplifying property of this matrix actually. So, that is how it is defined as the matrix norm actually, it is also called operator norm, induced norm, things like that various various terminologies actually. It is also true that if instead of carrying out this algebra, if I constrain myself to this norm equal to 1, then obviously, this is 1 norm of x equal to 1 and hence I all that I have to see is what is the maximum value it takes actually. Okay. And remember, it is there is a maximum operation involved actually, that means I I have to carry out uh, something like uh, uh, I have to see a family of x. I mean all sort of x actually whatever is there, and then I have to take take a maximum value whatever happens to be there. So maximum amplifying property that comes out of a matrix actually. So similarly, instead of this algebra turns out to be a little bit tougher because uh, I mean there will be infinite uh, possibilities and all that. So we confine ourselves to this constraint that norm of x equal to one, and then carry out something like a maximization operation I mean maximization analysis and all that and tell okay this is what the value is actually that is how it is defined. Again property sense it will satisfy some of these properties so that uh, norm of A has to be greater than 0, it is 0 only if the, the matrix A is like nothing but a 0 matrix all the elements of matrix are 0 then only it will happen to be like that. And for that uh, properties B and C are extremely similar to what we saw in the in the vector norm sense. Okay, and then it turns out that okay, uh, there is additional property that if I multiply a times b and then take a norm, then it turns out to be less than equal to norm a into norm e as well. Actually, this is this is a property that doesn't uh, it is not there in vector norm, but it is there in the matrix norm actually. So I hope it is uh, slightly clear now that uh, all that we are talking in a matrix norm is uh, looking at the amplifying property of matrix itself basically, and we take what uh, how much maximum it can amplify for a for a vector x actually that way. So, that is the concept and these are some of the properties involved.
So, again computational sense how do you compute uh, first norm one norm if you tell okay this is this is the definition that means, uh, you take all the elements of the matrix and, and then kind of take all the uh, I mean these absolute values and then all that you have to do is, uh, is formulate this uh, this column sum and all that. So, let me just uh, I mean just to demonstrate that. So, this is uh, this is something like okay if I have a matrix A and then talk about something like uh, entries everywhere all that I take is just absolute values of everything all the all the elements whatever I have and then I can do a summation here okay this way okay or a summation that way either way okay. And then take okay if I see the summations here and see whether out of these three I mean three or whatever values are there which is the maximum or I can also tell okay which is the maximum here actually out of all the three things. So, this is what the concept one is the maximum row sum and one is the maximum column sum actually. This is what is uh, what is talked here and uh, it turns out to be the largest absolute column sums uh, it is uh, your uh, first norm okay. If I take uh, column by column okay and then see the values here and then uh, end of the columns actually addition, addition of all the values and then tell okay what is the largest value among those possibilities that is nothing but your uh, one norm. And similarly infinity norm turns out to be the last largest absolute uh, row sum as well. Okay, that means, you do not carry out the column sums, but you carry out something like a row sum and then see what is what turns out to be in the right hand side and then then tell okay, what is the maximum value out of that that turns out to be infinity norm. And just a hint of note I mean uh, so how do you remember these two it, uh, letter 1 turns out to be vertically I mean place 1 turns out to be a vertical notation and the infinity turns out to be slightly horizontal notation actually. So, using that probably you can think of uh, carrying out algebra. But also we take uh, two norm many times in analysis and then synthesis and the two norm turns out to be some concept called maximum singular value of A. Now, what is singular value we will we'll see that and remember this uh, matrix norm and all when you talk the matrix need not be square it can be, I mean it can be a rectangular matrix as well actually and singular values are also defined for rectangular values <laughs> Eigen values are not by the way. So, singular values be, can be defined like that uh, remember uh, a transpose a is always guaranteed to be symmetric. So, we can talk about Eigen values of th that matrix and then uh, remember a transpose a is also guaranteed to be I mean positive semi definite. So, the Eigen values are guaranteed to be either either 0 or greater than 0. So, we can talk about a square root of that and then take only positive square root of that and define that as singular values. And in general it is defined something like this, uh, this uh, 8 star when you see somewhere this it turns out that if, if your A matrix itself contains uh, these complex numbers and all that then this is this complex conjugate values and things like this, conjugate transpose actually you take complex conjugates and then take a transpose. This will satisfy many properties similar to a transpose. So, if you simply take transpose uh, using this complex numbers and all it will not satisfy what we know in as transpose in real matrices actually. So, most of the algebra will be very compatible when you do this A star operation with nothing but you take the complex conjugate and then take the transpose actually conjugate transpose. Anyway, so this is the idea there you carry out this algebra take the Eigen values of this matrix is guaranteed to be positive uh, greater than equal 0 take the square root of that and you will end up with a singular values actually. All right. So, uh, then there is there are concepts for uh, least square solution and all that. Uh, so, the question here is something like this. Uh, if the uh, I mean there is an equation linear system of equation a x equal to b and then we are asking for uh, solution for x actually okay. Now, in our uh, previous knowledge and all that it is very standard that if uh, if m equal to n that means it is a square system a is a square matrix and you have equal number of variables as a as number of equations then uh, there is a unique solution x equal to a inverse v okay. It is a very standard result we all know that, but the question is what if a is non square matrix. Okay, so, that is where uh, uh, let us see the standard results here and if it is non square then either m can be less than n or m can be greater than n and here you are talking about m is less than n that means number of equations are less than number of variables certainly something like uh, an under constraint problem. And if it is under constraint problem obviously, we can think of having a solution which will satisfy the equations exactly and in addition to that we can do anything something else actually okay, because we have more freedom and we have less constraints. So, we can think of a solution in fact, it, uh, it has infinite solution which will satisfy the equations exactly. Now, out of the equations uh, so out of the solution that satisfy the equation exactly 
what kind of solution that are of interest to us actually. So, obviously, one one answer to that is minimum norm solution basically. That means, uh, suppose you, you are talking about uh, x being a control variable uh, for a second, then we want to have a solution for this for which we uh, will apply minimum control really basically. Okay. Because we, we are not compromising anything on the solution quality, Quali solution is certainly satisfied exactly. But we want to satisfy that with minimum control value as well actually. So, that is how we, we can think of the utility part of it. So, that is how it is formulated and the solution turns out to be something called pseudo inverse A x equal to A pseudo inverse B and then it is something like pseudo inverse is defined like this and also we know that uh, pseudo inverse can be both right pseudo inverse or left pseudo inverse and in this particular example it turns out to be right pseudo inverse actually. Okay. So, this is how it is uh, remember this solution will satisfy the equation exactly as well. Okay. So, under constraint problems are typically luxury in a way basically. Then uh, what if there is over constraint problem exactly the reverse case where the number of equations are more than number of variables and obviously, in this case assuming that all these uh, constraints are linearly independent uh, that means, uh, all these constraints have meaningful constraints and not uh, some combination of other constraints and all that. Then it turns out that we cannot do a perfect job, we can never aim to satisfy the solution exactly, but if you cannot do that the next best is how can you get a solution which will approximately satisfy this equation. Okay. So, that, that is the formulation here, it talks about minimizing the error quantity, uh, second norm of the error quantity. Remember A x equal to b is the equation, so A x minus b is the error sort of thing. So, if you talk about that then it is nothing but minimization of the error associated with all the equations actually. And the interestingly, the solution again turns out to be pseudo inverse b, okay. but this time this uh, pseudo inverse is defined something like this, it is called left pseudo inverse. And sometimes it can be argued this way also, it is very easy to see that. So, if you have this uh, something like a x equal to b, then you all that you do is multiply a transpose both sides, okay. So, you let up land up with that, and a transpose a comes from here, so you land up with a transpose a inverse a transpose and b. So, that is uh, you can uh, you can interpret that way as well. So, easy to see that actually, but you will not be able to do this exercise that way that easily in, in this case actually. It requires a little bit further algebra actually. Okay. All right, but the point to note here is this solution what you are getting here will not satisfy the, the, the equation exactly, okay. it will satisfy only approximately basically that way. All right. So, this uh, in general this is the left pseudo inverse, this is the right pseudo inverse and some of the properties that pseudo inverse satisfy is something like that. And you can see very closely it will feel as if it is a inverse actually. If I talk about a, a pseudo inverse a that means, if I close the bracket here or close the bracket here it, it feels like identity actually. Okay. So, that means, uh, it is a and similarly, if I if I take the other operation if I say this bracket or close this bracket and interpret the pseudo inverse as uh, nothing but inverse then I will end up with the other one actually. Okay. So, it will it will it will feel very close to what the inverse property satisfies that is why it is called uh, pseudo inverse actually. Okay, and uh, very, in, I mean, uh, also remember in a compatibility sense, if A happens to be a square matrix and determinant of A is not equal to zero, then pseudo inverse is nothing but inverse actually, and it is very easy to see that here uh, as well actually. Okay, so we we'll end up with a matrix uh, inverse sort of thing actually. That is how it is. Now, before we conclude this uh, this lecture, it's also time to see some of this uh, vector matrix calculus in general. Uh, in so far, we have been talking about vectors and matrices containing numbers, but what if they are functions of some other variable? Okay, so uh, that is where our, our most interest lie. I mean, uh, lies as well, because most of our state variables and control variables, all these are time varying actually. So, if you have a time varying function sitting as a matrix, and then you can certainly talk about their differentiation as well as their integration. And by definition, it simply turns out that if I take component by component differentiation, that's my differentiation of vector x. And if I take component by component integration, that turns out to be my integration of vector x actually. Okay. So, that is simply by definition. But there are interesting algebra after that. Uh, so, uh, this is also true for matrix actually. If I have a matrix A with uh, all the elements are time varying, then by definition uh, d by d t of uh, A is nothing but uh, all this, uh, the component by component differentiation. Similarly, integration is also component by component, very, very easy to see that. But after that, there are certain standard results again. Uh, if I talk about uh, talk about uh, differentiation of uh, a plus b, where a is a function of time and b is a function of time, then it nothing but a dot plus b dot. That's that's how it turns out to be. It's very easy to see that anyway. 
So, all that you have to do here is again go back to this definition a is nothing but like that. So, a dot is like that similarly formulate b is nothing but b 1 1 b 1 2 like that. So, b dot will be like that. So, add it up ok one side you add up a t plus b t and then take differentiation use that standard definition other side you just add it up this 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 a dot and b dot on the right hand side. So, you will very easily see that this 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 is uh, very much true and it is feels very much trivial as well actually in a way. So, d by d t of a plus a t a plus b t by definition simply you expand the matrix and then put the definition of differentiation combine it back again and you will very very quickly see that is nothing but a dot plus b dot. Similarly, but this one is uh, very interesting I remember d by d by d t or the differentiation of uh, a times b where uh, a and b both are functions of time. This again satisfies a result that we uh, very closely know in, in scalar algebra actually scalar calculus. But the only only uh, I mean only difference or that careful thing that you have to do here is you cannot change the sequence really. Remember a b is, is uh, not equal to b a in general okay. the dimensions can be different a b can be defined b a may not be defined and things like that. And a dot and b dot will uh, will carry the dimensionalities of a and b along with them simply from definition dimensionality does not change. So, obviously, these the definitions uh, in a reverse and, uh, and all that is not defined actually. So, be careful while uh, while using this formulation I mean formulas and all that it is true, but it is true in the same sequence sense only basically. Yeah. Then this is also easy to kind of uh, derive that uh, dy dt of a inverse uh, is nothing but that it is again if you just interpret a as a scalar quantity then it is nothing but uh, a dot divided by a square actually. Yeah, but in a matrix sense you have to write that way only you cannot write it that way and also remember the division of matrices are not defined. So, d a by d t is a matrix divided by if somebody writes a square and all that. So, this matrix divided by another matrix is not defined actually it is simply the multiplication that is defined actually. So, it turns out to be like that and using this theorem I mean using this result it is easy to show that just that you have to do is take b equal to a inverse and then carry out this algebra it will end up here actually. Uh, if it is b is a inverse then uh, this is identity. So, d by d t is 0 and then the right hand side algebra you carry out then it will be very easy to show that it will turn out to be like that. Anyway, so now uh, moving further on calculus uh, I mean vector matrix calculus really uh, the gradient vector is something that we will heavily heavily use in uh, in optimal control theory and the gradient is defined something like that and again depends uh, see the x can be of n dimension. But uh, function of x, let us assume that it be it's a scalar quantity. So it's very exam very mm, a standard example is something like x one square plus x two square plus x three square like that actually. So ultimately the quantity is a scalar quantity, but the x vector contains uh, components basically. Okay. So in that sense, the del f by del x is a gradient vector. Okay, what it standardly or commonly known as, and that is defined like that. Remember, there is a transpose. So that is actually by definition we assume that it's a it's a kind of a column vector actually. Okay. This is the gradient vector denoted as del f by del x it is a column vector with partial derivatives like that. Okay. However, if f is f itself is a, a vector that means x is a vector and f is also a vector then the gradient vector is not called really a gradient it is called Jacobian matrix and this is defined something like that. We just saw that in something like linearization of uh, linear systems and all that. So, you have to carry out all these partial derivatives and then put it in this form then you will end up with uh, this Jacobian matrix uh, of f of x. Yeah. Then it ok how about second derivative uh, it is uh, if f of x uh, is a scalar quantity then the second derivative is uh, defined like this and remember this is a symmetric matrix guaranteed to be it is called Hessian matrix actually ok because this quantity del square f by del x 1 del x 2 is nothing but this quantity actually. So, no matter what order you take both are same. So, using that uh, that property it turns out to be this matrix is uh, kind of symmetric matrix all the time. Okay. Then there are certain derivative rules and all that uh, see del x uh, if it uh, if it is b is a constant mat constant vector rather and x is a x is a variable then del x del by del x of b transpose x or del by del x of x transpose b it turns out to be b actually. You can uh, think of it as a kind of a scalar algebra sort of thing, but uh, in general in wet in calc I mean met vector matrix calculus also this property is true actually. It is very easy to show that again simply by carrying out the long end algebra. You take uh, b equal to b 1, b 2, b 3 up to b n x equal to x 1, x 2 up to x n formulate this and then take the derivative component use the definition of derivative uh, and then you will end up that it is nothing but b 1, b 2, b 3 arranged in a column actually. So, there is nothing but b vector. 
Similarly, interestingly, it turns out that the partial derivative of uh, A x with respect to x turns out to be A okay. and partial derivative of x transpose A x turns out to be like that and as a corollary if A equal to A transpose that means, this is there then I can always talk about del by del x, del x of half of x transpose a x nothing but a x basically just use a plus a transpose nothing but 2 a and then it, it will get cancelled out this half will cancel out that will end up with a x and this result is something that we will use it heavily later. Okay. So, in general this is true, but if a is symmetric then this is true also. Okay. Then there are further results which tells you that okay, what if there are two functions uh, like that. So, if del by del x of f transpose z is what and again satisfies a very close relationship that we know in scalar calculus, uh, but again you cannot change the sequence here. So, this uh, this result is given something like this del f by del x transpose into z of x plus del z by del x transpose into f of x. Okay. And as a corollary if, a, if f happens to be a c vector then uh, it turns out to be like that and things like that actually. These are standard results coming out of the <coughs> coming out of that actually. Okay. So remember, f and g can be can be vectors by themselves actually here. Okay. So many times you use uh, these results also, especially when we talk about this uh, control affine systems and optimal control with that and things like that. Way. Now, what if if uh, g of x is truly a matrix? Then what actually? And then turns out like uh, if I if I have g of x times u this is where this control affine systems and all will come. I will tell about that uh, as we go along in the course what is affine systems and all that, but there will be a term something like that x dot equal to f of x plus g of x times u that is that kind of a form actually. So, if you have g of x times u and then you have to carry out this algebra and that is necessary for doing this optimal control analysis and all that. So, then this result turns out to be like that okay. and this can be derived like that where g 1, g 2 and all are vectors or column vectors coming out of this g matrix. Then you take the partial derivative and put it there in this form actually. Again, these are all long held algebra, it takes about couple of pages, but you can just put the plug in the standard results uh, from definition and carry out the long held algebra, you will get it there actually. So, as a special case, these things do happen. I mean, if you take only this as a scalar, this is a vector, something like that, and then this can turns out to be like this, it is a corollary of all the results that we know. So, what about chain rules then? I mean, if you have function of function, then, then what actually? So, it turns out to be x is a vector, but f is a function, and then I take another function of that. And then the game starts that okay, x can be a vector in general, but this small f and big f uh, can take different forms. First, you take okay, if the small f is a vector and big f is also a vector, a eh, sorry, if small f is a scalar and big f is also a scalar, then this is the result. And if small f is a, is a scalar, but big f is a, I mean, small f is a vector, but big f is a scalar then that is the result and if both are vectors then that is the result. It is very similar, I mean it is similar looking, but you have to worry about which comes first and whether there is a transpose or not actually. Okay. Again these are very standard results, you can have it in uh, somewhere and then if you want to use it, you can use this in your research proposal also actually. So, that is how I can uh, summarize this uh, this lecture uh, that uh, we have got some overview of what is nonlinear system and then uh, we carry out what is I mean what is called as linearization of nonlinear systems and all that. Then we talk, talked about various uh, matrix properties that uh, that goes along with uh, those matrices actually and many of these things we will use it subsequently in our uh, further uh, discussions of topics uh, related to optimal control. With that I will stop here, thank you.